and welcome to High Tailing Through History, a history podcast where two sisters get high and surprise each other with a story from history's vault of the weird and the wonderful. I'm Laurel, the older sister. That would make me Katie, the younger sister. Yeah, I'm Am not I sure on, this side? on which I side you're going to be on. I don't know what side I'm on with like you. <laughs> Always looks different in the final recording. So uh, the, there she is. There she is, folks. Katie, the younger sister. And uh, yeah, this is episode 67. So welcome. Welcome one and all. I just want to apologize in advance if you guys have noticed that I sound a little stuffy and clogged up. It's uh, it's because I am, actually. So I'm just trying to... <laughs> It's kind of like mouth sick. eating like a gross little goblin. Uh, so hopefully I sound somewhat okay to get across tonight. Katie, how's your weekend? How's, how are things? How are you doing? It's happening, man, you know? Huh? Yeah, I had to go uh, do a really intense workout routine. I had to row across the northern sea. Uh, okay. And then hail Satan like two hours later. So I had a very full weekend in case you wondered you're like i've got to uh row across the north sea i've got to hail satan in a couple of hours i'm just simply booked i i, can't I am i simply in. have no time for anything uh well I'm, I'm curious so what from <laughs> okay tell me well, how did we get to, to the north sea i mean you've experienced amina marth before no have you through a video through, through a video, video clips, the yeah. glorious video was it the one i sent you where we were all rowing when you saw the i've ever seen the the rope pit or whatever you call it i don't know if i've ever seen that <laughs> seen the rope pit? For, just search hashtag row pit and you'll find it okay. um you won't be disappointed it's a song called put your back into the oar and they you get down in the middle of the song and they the drums boom 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 row and you just fucking row yeah. right on okay it's good do you have to peel yourself that. up off the floor afterwards i imagine it's like sticky as hell you, you know as sad as that is i've never been in the pit for Amnamarth. oh okay i know so you're I in couldn't your chair and you're like doing it i was roll. fucking rolling from my chair hardcore like with my That's migraine cool. i was like fucking rowing i had all the merch in one hand because uh blake and our uh friend who I won't name here because people's privacy, but I, I all in one hand, I was like one handed rowing with all the merch in my other hand. Like I was like, I'm fucking rowing, bro. We were going to cross that Northern sea. Yeah. You've got Our only view was hand. the distant shore. What? Yeah. It's like plunder in one hand and rowing in the other. Yes. You're like I'm not putting down the goods. Guys. Absolutely. Yeah. It was fabulous. They are as amazing as they always are. Man, I gotta say, the only thing that makes me, like, a little bit sad is they're getting old. <laughs> oh. I don't mean that, like, they did it any worse or anything. They're fantastic, and I love them. But you can see visibly they're aging on their faces. And I'm like, damn. Don't age on me, man. <laughs> Who's gonna come lead the row pit? And, uh, yep, I got to see Loki. Loki comes out is for Deceiver of the Gods. Have mm -hmm. I really never showed you any of this stuff? I don't think so. Oh, that's depressing, because let me tell you, it is a good time. I feel like anyone who, even if you're not, like, a fan of Amunamarth, you would enjoy the concert. The okay. Midgard Serpent comes out, and he was he was trying to fucking slay it with Thor's hammer, dude. And as he hit it, I think it broke, and it wasn't supposed to, because he, like, looked at it, and he was like, well, shit, and threw it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, that's tragic. Thromir is, uh broken in pieces oh dude like, I like a lady thor out there to like come and <laughs> do it right that's right that's what they need to do no more big bearded uh, men because there's plenty of them there it sounds theatrical as hell and i yeah. love that yeah it was theatrical i mean i'm not i mean it's great i feel like ghost maybe had more theatrics uh it was very mm -hmm. interesting it was like how would one describe this <laughs> it was like being in Notre Dame, but not God. The fans to Ghost were so in, like, into what was happening, like they were fucking there for it. And I was like, dude, this is amazing. And I love being in a crowd where, like, 
they're into it. Like it, it, it makes me enjoy it more because sure. I'm getting, I'm like, all right, dude, I got to get on these people's level. Like this is fucking touching their soul. I got to get in with this. I got to understand what's happening here. Like, I love it when people are like super into it. That's what a lot of people have said to me at concerts. They're like, I enjoyed it more because you were enjoying it. <laughs> like at the first time we were at Amina Marth, we were all the way up on the balcony and people were like, oh, dude, like you would have thought you were front row. Like you were going ham. I was like, dude, I was living it. We were crossing the Northern Seas with lightning and the sea spray on us. Like, we were fucking living it, dude. Uh, Yeah, it was amazing. Did I tell you? I found out it's like he does all of that. He does all the instruments, first of all, which who has time to learn that many instruments? Because there's like 10 of them. There's like nine band members behind him or something like that. I don't know. I'd have to go count, but that's way too much work. (laughs) And like, dude, he does all of that, puts it all together, and then hires people to tour with him. Yeah. Who has that much time on their hands? That's cool. I know um, I've seen Nine Inch Nails a couple of times, and I know Trent Reznor does that. And I think um, I've not seen Beck before, but I think he does that, or at least most of it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it, it. but that's really cool. That's really that's a lot of talent to have, right, dude? And <laughs> I looked him up, and like. Expecting a very metal dude, he was a little bit, like, kind, kind, but a little nerdier looking than I anticipated, and I was like, fuck yeah, dude, get it. I've seen him, yeah. Yeah. It almost makes it better for me, because I myself am a massive nerd, so I'm like, ah, we're all in this together. (laughs) I think, I think a lot of metal people, at least metal people that I know, are Mm -hmm. nerdy in some sort of way. They're, they Mm -hmm. they usually, like, um science fiction or fantasy novels they like oh yeah that sort of stuff in the uh, rings which is great um but yeah i've noticed that from any metal fan i've ever met yeah we're cultured bro <laughs> that's who they are which is great it makes and also it kind of makes you a little bit less scary too like because you can look like oh yeah death on two legs kind of thing and you can look really scary but then you've got like this teddy bear heart you're like a you're like a metal build a bear, you know. You've got your little yeah. heart in there. You're all stuffed and all sweet. We need to make a metal you... build a bear shirt. Yeah, you uh, you roll that d twenty on the weekends and stuff like that. And like, I've never uh, played Dungeons and Dragons. Sweet. I've got one up on you. I know you do. I feel like you, me, Blake, of course, the the dungeon master, the ultra nerd. With love. Um, the cat would have to be involved so she can fuck up the dice a few times. Yep. <laughs> Knock a few things neutral. over. Yeah, that's her. <laughs> oh, she's chaotic evil. Don't be silly. She doesn't Aww. get to stay neutral. Um, and, uh... Oh, God. What was I going to say? But just... You good? Oh, I'll talk about my drink here in a second. Oh, well, I think this is the perfect segue for you Ooh. to talk about your drink. Otherwise, I'll wax Ooh. eloquently on about metal. So maybe now's the sip. cutoff. Oh yeah, that was my my second sip of it. I because I'm feeling time. the way I'm feeling. I uh, I was like, Christian, can you can you make me a hot toddy, please? And he was like, Yeah, sure, These absolutely. Are so like, good. Put it in the thermos so it stays hot when I'm while I'm talking. It's like absolutely. Uh, I don't drink whiskey. I, mm-hmm. I wish I did. I really would like to be able to drink. You whiskey, gallantly I try every time, and it just isn't happening for you, man. It is and what it is. This is quite strong. You're a gin and tonic gal. Yeah, or like a vodka and something, or some wine. And so, yeah, I'll uh, I'll find my way through that <laughs> and see see what kind of state I'm in at the at the end of it all. But uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be just fine. Uh, what do you say, Katie? Let's do some history. All right. Bottle leaf grinder. Here we go. Bottle leaf grinder. Shoot. Ooh. All right. So Katie's grinder to my bottle. I smashed it and I get to go first. I'm like immediately like. I, I feel like there feel. should be a flame at the end of your, like a blue flame at the end of your fist. There. In the history of both the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, there have been countless people who have stood up against the Romans and rebelled in some fashion. 
And a few of these rebels were famous women who have had their names etched into the history books, like ding, 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 such as Queen Boudicca of the Iceni, Cleopatra the Seventh. Although I like to kind of think she's like Madonna or Prince, you know, she's just Cleopatra. <laughs> that like yeah, the she, one we all know. The one we all know and love. Yes, Cleopatra. Is that the one the who seven. got rolled into a rug? That's that's what's said. I don't know that much about Cleopatra to be able to say like somebody's oh, got to somebody's got to make that happen because I know El Zippo about her. Okay, El Zippo. <laughs> and then another one on that list is Queen Zenobia. So let's go back to ancient Rome. If you're not so versed with Roman history, our girl Rome, she has two eras, right? Hmm. Okay, so she has her Republic era and her Empire era. Bro, it's like Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. The prequels <laughs> and the original trilogy. That change happened in 27 BCE when Julius Caesar's adopted son, Augustus, became ruler of Rome, consolidated all that power under one person, himself, and then, you know, continued to rule. And everyone after that continued to rule in that same manner, in that autocratic manner. Before that, in the Roman Republic, no one leader had all the power. They had the elected officials, the Senate, which didn't go so well for Julius Caesar, as we know. But um, that's when that change happened. Now, in our portion of history today, Rome has now been in her empire era. She's autocratic. She's conquered. She's expanded. Uh, she's reveling in the power. She's pushing that Latin on all the people. And she is the largest ancient empire. And girl, she's loving the title, right? Before the transition back in 64 BCE, so a little bit before that, the Romans conquered what we now know today as Syria and within it, the city of Palmyra. Palmyra's in this really lovely little geographic spot that's approximately halfway between the Mediterranean Sea and the Euphrates River, which along with its neighboring river, the Tigris, make up... Um, so the cradle of civilization. Right, Fertile Crescent. Okay. That's that same area. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. So she's right. Palmyra's right there in the middle of those, those places. Moisturized and thriving. Moisturized, thriving, yes. I mean, she is a literal oasis in the desert. Um, between the yeah, east yeah. and the west, a trade crossroads, uh, all the wealth that came into the city allowed them to beautify everything. So she's she's gorgeous. Palmyra is known as the pearl of the desert. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. She's living it. She's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Over the centuries since coming under Roman rule, Palmyra remained generally an autonomous city-state and everyone enjoyed the trade and subsequent wealth that came out of their relationship together. Fast forward now to third century CE. Vibes are off, as the cool kids would say. The vibes mm. are off in the Roman Empire. And actually, when you look back at Roman history, ancient Roman history, there's a huge section that's just called Crisis of the Third Century. <laughs> and it was and it was a hundred years pretty much of It's a crisis. Uh, it's a crisis. And it is too. It is usurper after usurper and people battling for uh the role of empire or emperor, sorry. And civil wars breaking out all over the place. The vastness of the Roman Empire and its instability at the time also allowed for the outbreak of several uprisings mm -hmm. and even two breakaway full blown empires. I feel like it could possibly be renamed the soap opera era of Rome because everything you just described was the most soap opera-ish I've ever it seen. Is. It is. Aside Why don't people... we have a dark shadow style soap opera era of the, the crisis of Rome? Can you even mm -hmm. imagine the goss, the tea that you would have to like work off? The material you have to work off of oh, is yeah. insane. Oh, yeah. You think Game of Thrones is good? Where do you get to soap opera Rome? So far, you have no idea. Century, man. Titties everywhere. <laughs> well, you gotta, you know, get the views, man. Right. Um, you know, all the sex. Um, uh, yeah. HBO, yeah. are you listening? They're the ones to do it, right? <laughs> the third. What did you say? It was the what crisis? Crisis of the third century. The crisis the third century of the third century. century. You don't even have to name it. It's fucking named already. TM TM. Last TM. time ours, on ours Crisis of the Third Century. Augustus, you know, blah, 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 and then whoever poisoned who, and then the uprising over in this era. Like, listen. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you. You're 
you're kind of on the money there. It's oh, it's a shit show, really. And there's just it's just a revolving door of people coming in and out of leadership positions in Rome. Back in Palmyra, the city state has been enjoying its trade, its wealth, its beauty, and its leader, Odonathus, is well loved. Which is always nice. You know, it's mm. like a golden time for the most part. It's nice to love your leader. It's something that yeah. we don't get very often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's loved by the Palmyrans, like his people. And then Rome is happy because he's helped out with a few of those fires that I mentioned. Uh, one of them being that he defended Palmyra from the Persians out east. They're encroaching and he's like, no, back, 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 back. That's a worthy goal. The Persians, yeah. weren't they the ones with the war elephants? Yeah. Holy shit. Anytime I think of the Persians, I always immediately think of, and this is not historically accurate in terms of the like the visualization, but I always think of uh, Xerxes from 300. With all this, like, like sweet shit. nose ring and yeah, shit. He's beautiful. He's like he's a 10 fucking feet tall. chandelier. I don't know. Yeah. And he's like, I'm a benevolent god. He's got the most like buttery voice. And I'm like, what? oh, he does though. What? what? You what can benevolence so all over me. Head. Listen, let me talk to you right now. Yeah. So. He doesn't play in this story, but that's what's in my mind when I think of the Persian. Is there actually a, what was his name? Xerxes? Xerxes, yeah. Does he actually exist? Yes. Xerxes was a real person who existed in history. Mm, and cool. so the, like, the Battle of Thermopylae, which the movie 300 is based on, oh, okay. is real. It's I don't think I've cut. ever seen 300. Oh, no. I think I've seen it. clips. Oh. Very good. Is I it? like it. I like I the it. style of how it's it done. He kicks a guy into a pit. But he looks at his lady beforehand to be like, is this cool? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw him down this pit. And she gives like a little nod. And then he just turns around and just kicks him. And I was like, oh, they're so hot together. Damn. Isn't that Gerard Butler, who's the lead dude? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that man in sneakers? Holy shit. Oh, look it up. Look up the bounty hunter and what was the other one? I don't know. That man in sneakers is illegal. Illegally good looking. Yep. Yep. And I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Indeed. But seriously, look Indeed. up that man I, in sneakers. You. you you will it, your life will be changed. Okay. You are welcome. All of you. Who else is welcome is Rome, the Roman Empire, because yes. the Persians would have trampled their way through there, and Onassis is like, not today. Uh, uh, uh. So Palmyra and is not just a city. It's like a... It's a true it's city a tiny state. country. Oh, it is just a city. City-state. Yeah, so it has its own okay. sort of government within it. And, and I'm not sure how many, how much, or sorry, how much of the land around it was That's included. That's more of what I was referring to, yeah. I mean, just, you say hold off the Persians, I'm thinking, shit, you've got an army. Like, you don't just have, yes. like, an army, you have, like, an army. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. They have forces, so they're, for sure. They're not pushovers, in, the, in other words. Right. Okay. Well, just think, like, Sparta. Sparta was a city-state. But they're... Oh, that's right. They warriors, were. God, right? it's been so long since I've studied Greece. That's okay. We don't have to talk about Sparta anymore, actually. <laughs> we're going to go to Palmyra. Goodness. Yeah. We're leaving them. We're leaving them. We're in Pal Palmyra, and Rome awards Odonathus with the title of Governor of All the East. Hmm. All right. Swish. But Odonathus, as you know, befitting a man of his birth and what his title would be if he didn't have Roman overlords, if you will, Mm -hmm. um, he styled himself as the king of Palmyra. He was born as a ruling class. He wasn't yeah. just some guy that Rome was like, here's a little puppet leader. He was their leader that was kept there. And then his own people gave him the title later of king of kings. Hmm. Bougie. Bougie. Yes. Damn. But alas, <laughs> going up this mountain, we're going to come on back down again. Alas, out of the blue, in a bit of a palace intrigue, but a palace scandal, Odonathus and his son from a previous marriage were murdered. Oh, Just suddenly Wait. murdered out of the blue. Now, we don't really know the motives behind the murders. It's one of those history mystery things. Um, for the most part, a lot of historians say that Odonathus' own cousin or his own nephew was the one who did it after um, something happened during a hunting trip and they got really pissed off about it and decided to kill his uncle or cousin and his son. That would be a bit petty. Yeah. Did someone pay somebody to do it? We don't know. Hmm. But um, some people will say, well, was it Zenobia, who we're going to talk about here in just a second? But that one, while very intriguing and, you know, makes people go, ooh, ooh la la, mm -hmm. a lot of historians have also said, mm, 
based on our information that we have, we don't really think that that's a very, um, very good theory for what ha what happened. But it doesn't okay. really matter because either way, he's been killed, and there's an opening for leader of Palmyra. There's a transfer of power from Odinathus to his son Wobblot. But Wobblot is I know <laughs> I love saying his name. It's like wobble a lot, yeah. What? But, <laughs> It's not spelled like that, but that's what I like to think of. It oh, man, he lot. was made fun of in school. Mm. Even his tutors laughed at him. <laughs> Nerd. Oh. <laughs> Wabala is too young. It's estimated that he's about 10 or 11 years old, so his mother, Zenobia, who is Odinathus' widow, becomes regent. So here's Zenobia. But it's not her? Well, for the sake of time with, with our story tonight... A lot of sources say, like, when Odinathus was ruling Palmyra, the two of them were very good together as a couple in terms uh. of, like, she, um, you know, he had very specific systems in place. He was working on expanding their land and holding things down. And so it wouldn't have made so sense was, for like, her to kill him. Those things. Say it again? I said, so it wouldn't have made sense for her to kill him. She was already benefiting off of a mutually beneficial right. relationship right okay yeah. interesting mm -hmm. right i just think like when the husband goes missing or like dead or whatever i'm like like seriously like that scheming mm. always yeah, making myself when that sort of thing top. happens you gotta look at the spouse and that could very well be the case but i don't want to speculate on that any further because no I'm that's not, not but i'm but... just saying at some point a little mystery history here is just so i, just mm -hmm. talk about. So I need to talk to the mystery. historians who studied this so when i get my hands on them just you wait not in a bad way, like in an educational, like, tell me everything you know way. Yeah. So Zenobia, she's really only in the history books for being a spouse, spouse of Odinathus, and also for what she's about to do in the rest of our story tonight. Mm. Uh, we really don't know much about her early life at all. From my sources and how they went through the primary sources, which, surprise, surprise, are a bit dubious in the reliability during this time period, one isn't necessarily spoiled for choice in terms of their primary sources. When we come to Zenobia, we have uh, three historians. Well, four, four sets of histories, basically. So we have the we have uh, historians Zosimus, Zenaris, and an Arab historian named Al Tabari. And then, where we get more information from that we can't rely on, is a collection of histories called the Historia Augusta which is a very famous set of histories, but is also famously unreliable to the point where in one part of the book, it will say one thing and they'll say completely the opposite thing later. So you're like, I don't know what's going on here. Hmm. So that's weird. Well, that's unfortunately pretty classic with the classics. <laughs> it, no, I know what you're saying. It, it is really, it's very difficult to find unbiased. Well, you and I have said it, pretty early on in this podcast i mean the history is often written by the victor and things do get changed so sometimes it is very hard to know um like anytime i study anything norse most of it is written down by a christian but their bias and their opinion comes into it and it does change the narrative sometimes mm -hmm. so yeah it's tough it's it's not easy yeah and and this happened with Boudicca as well, too, with Tacitus mm -hmm. and Cassius Dio. Like, they, de depending on and the, the fact that the person's a quote-unquote foreigner in their eyes, mm -hmm. that they're a woman, that right there is Yeah, just didn't you terrible. say one of them, like, hated women? Yeah, I think we get kind of the impression that he didn't really like women too much. I think it was Cassius Dio. Oh, shoot, I can't remember offhand. But one of them writes, and it's like this with Zenobia, too. There's some times where they're like, and then a woman thinks that she can have but the imperial mantle about her shoulders which is um and and it was something like an, and keep it for far longer than a person of their sex ought or something like that and i was like wow all right buddy yeah <laughs> so there's that kind of stuff you're dealing with boy so, would they have such a culture shock if they traveled into today they'd be like what in the hell yeah so much of Zenobia's story is wrapped in mythos and legend. 
there's a lot of romanticizing of this woman who thumbed her nose at Rome and was defiant against an empire. And she's a baddie for sure. Like, I don't want to depower her story and who she was. But um, even though we're high history, I <laughs> also want to make sure we're telling history as best we can and pointing these discrepancies out and this, these nuances. So what I really liked was my main source, which was one of the only few books about her called Queen Zenobia of Palmyra, The History and Legacy of the Ancient Levant's Most Famous Queen by the Charles Rivers Editors. They just do like little textbooks, education books. Good Lord. But, yeah. But I like that the authors, um, they, you know, took the primary sources, they thought critically about them, compared them to what we know about ancient Rome and other cultures at this time, and they could pick through it that way. So. So gave That's you the most, most unbiased, well put together yeah. process that you could possibly find. Yeah, I tried. Yeah. And then I also used a Nat Geo article by David Hernandez de la Fuente. Um, so those are all of my sources if you want to check those out. To Zenobia. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. <laughs> we don't know much <laughs> about her early life, as I mentioned. Based on events in Odonathus' life, histor historians have pieced together some things and think that she was probably born around 240 CE and then perhaps married Odonathus when she was about 14, which is typical of the time. Regarding her late husband's assassination, again, for whatever reason it happened, we don't need to spend that much time on it because the historians don't know themselves. Odonathus and his son, Herodes, were murdered. Zenobia and Odonathus's eldest son, Wabalot, are pro proclaimed new ruler. But he's so young, Zenobia becomes regent, and she's good. She's smart. She's charismatic. She's beautiful. She's well liked by her people. I would say she was because, already half ruling them before, is what it sounded like. So, well, she was, she was seen because she was the wife of their leader. You know, it wasn't necessarily that she was making any sort of laws or decrees, if you will. But I mean, the people knew who she was, and you know, she was Odonathus's wife, and like we like him, we like her, kind of thing. Yeah. She can speak a few languages. She knew a lot of sciences and philosophies. She filled her court with scholars and philosophers from all the surrounding area in order to like him yeah. talk and chat about these things. Like, let's share ideas. I love that. Yeah. And then uh, she created her own worldview based on uh, a few different religions in the area, too Judaism, Christianity, and Manichaeism, which was a brand new religion to the scene that same century. And Manichaeism combined Christian, Gnostic, and pagan elements, and it was founded in Persia. So we're gathering a lot of different influences from around mm -hmm. Palmyra. It's very much a crossroads, Palmyra. Yeah, absolutely. And along with that, she was really smart in how she carried herself. So um, particularly with the men around her, she had this mentality of like, act like a guy, like do as the men do. If they're going to go out hunting, you're going to go out hunting. If they're going to have a drink, you're going to have a drink and talk politics and things like that. So mm. instead of being in the background as sort of like, well, I'm a woman and that's not my place. She's like, no, I'm, I'm getting in there and you're going to see me and I'm going to act as leader here. You're not going to bulldoze me into anything. Right. Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> in the rest of the Roman empire, Upheaval, <laughs> upheaval, emperor after emperor, fires big and small all over the empire. Zenobia continues on the path of her late husband. As I said, he had a lot of policies that she maintained, and she's not only holding down their territory, but she's, she's now starting to annex surrounding land. Mm. And this is all because Rome is distracted. Uh, she annexes she's not stupid she's not stupid she annexes all of syria and then most of anatolia which is what is modern day turkey or turkey you know it that way and she's not really rocking the boat too much she's not being a jerk about it she's just quietly doing this in the background but that changes however when she decides to send her forces to roman egypt there looks to be an Egyptian who began a revolt when the Roman emperor stepped out of town. And Zenobia sends one of her most trusted advisors, Zabdas, who is one of her generals, along with the army to quell this uprising in late 269 or early 270. 
And at first it looks like she did kind of what Odinathus did. Like, don't worry, I've taken care of Persia. She's like, don't worry, I've taken care of Egypt. Everything's good in my hands, don't worry. But I'm not going to give it back. <laughs> Ooh. And Rome is like, wait, what? Rome's no, I'm sorry, what? Like, right, Rome's like, cool, 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 cool. Wait, hold, what? <laughs> yeah. Hold because up. guess what? <laughs> Egypt supplied Rome's grain and their food. So to cut Egypt off, oh, yeah, because the they were the super Empire, agricultural. Yeah. And so this was quite the power move. Okay, here we go. Here's a history debate for you. Why did Zenobia decide to revolt against Rome? You know, I mean, we don't know. I don't know for sure. I mean, the time was right. <laughs> yeah. Any uh, half-together tactician would have chosen that point. It's the only time you're going to get Rome weak. And if you can chip away at it, you've then assured your own countries. Yeah, it's not getting any more comforting, is it? Keep trying. Let's keep getting there. Oh. I just feel like I'm doing lemony shots of bourbon. No honey? Bourbon. What? No honey? I'm sure there's honey in there, but I can't tell. Okay. Does your throat feel soothed at all? Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I don't know. And those who are smarter than me, they don't quite know either, really. Well, I'm sure everyone has their theories. Yeah, there is okay. no catalyst of wrongs. So what we saw with Boudicca, so to compare this to a story that you know, hmm. you know, who she also was a loyal Roman subject until... Dude, I loved Boudicca. Yeah. They fucking, they were wrong for that, bro. Yeah. I'm just gonna fucking come out and say it. Yeah. So they were, they were fine until Gaius Suetonius Paulinus came in and for no reason whatsoever brutally assaulted her daughters and publicly publicly with all this um and beat her yeah, he um, was a fucking so, twat waffle i <laughs> sorry yes. i also would burn everything to the ground too if that you know i mean i'm like yes Boudica, i'm behind you three thousand percent dude that was tame dude i would have <laughs> yeah man we won't even go into it we've but established that... <laughs> that i would be a tyrant but that was the catalyst for upheaval, right? For that. That was why she was like, oh my gosh, you mess with my girls. You mess with my family and my people. That's it. Yeah. Like, we're done. I'm killing you all. Yeah. Um, but Zenobia didn't have anything like that. I mean, thank goodness. But uh, it was probably because, yeah, Rome was unstable that she thought she's like, it's a good time. Uh, I could maybe do something here. Mm -hmm. Or because of its, its instability, she's like, I have to protect our economic interests. I have to keep yeah. the city, city thriving. Is a big one, I think. That's a. And it's worth noting that everything she did, she did under her son's name. She acted as regent and not like this. We'll put a diffusion of responsibility there. Like, it was well, waddle a lot. <laughs> waddle a lot. But that's, that's important, though, because she is regent. First and foremost, she is regent and mm -hmm. she is doing this under, and she's a woman, and she's doing this under a male face and male name, who also is showing a dynasty of Odinathus. It's Odinathus' son. Mm -hmm. So it's not like just some guy, and it's not a woman. Ugh, women, ugh, women leaders, right? You know, like it's none of those sort of things that's going to get people all riled up. They're like, oh, yeah, wobble up. We got you. So Zenobia has Egypt, Syria, Jordan, large parts of Anatolia, Turkey, and modern-day Saudi Arabia and Iraq. She's got a huge area now at this yeah. point. And in history, we call this the Palmyrene Empire. Up to this point, Roman emperors, the many, many Roman emperors that came before, have either been too distracted, too low on resources, or frankly, too weak to do anything about it. I was going to say, they probably don't even fucking know what's going on. Well, they know. But everyone's kind of like, like, what do we do here? I was going to say, what are you going to do her? about it? Yeah. That'd be me. What are you going to do about it? That is, until we come to Lucius Domitus Aurelianus, who will henceforth, henceforth be called Aurelian. So have okay. you heard the phrase, Vene Vidi Vici? The, I say with um... my really stuffy nose. Uh, I came, I saw, I conquered, or I won. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I know it. That's popularly attributed to Julius Caesar. You want to know what's said about Aurelian? 
the song, a little line in the song. Okay. Melee, 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 Osidit. A thousand, a thousand, a thousand, he is killed. Nice. Dude, that's nice. brutal. He sounds so nice. He's the um, only part of the song I listened to. Because <laughs> it was as close to metal as you got back in the day. <laughs> And Aurelian is a whole different emperor, uh, animal from the emperors before him. He's proved himself as a very successful military leader, having mm -hmm. squashed these revolts all over the empire. And he takes power in 270 CE, which is either the same year or within the same year that uh, Zenobia has taken Egypt. Mm -hmm. And unlike those before him, he's like, I'm not going to ignore and I won't ignore what's going on because this is our food supply. And also, fuck that. We got to show this lady who's boss kind of thing right and he divided his um, uh his army and he Ooh. sends forty thousand soldiers to go deal with it and to egypt and then another forty thousand to go to syria via a little germanic uprising that's happening so he's gonna go take care of this uprising and then go take care of zenobia and her uprising oh divided you gotta watch those germanic tribes i think it was them who eventually do bring about the first fall of the Roman Empire, if I remember correctly. Mm. Could have been. They're they're rising up quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, not they do. They, no, they weren't, but I seem to remember the Romans were very, very, very cruel to them. They yes. did not like the barbarians from the north, let's put it that way. Yeah. Military stuff time. Are you ready? So after taking his troops to deal with the Germanic tribes, he gets the Palmyrene Empire about four months later into the city of Tiana, which is in Anatolia. He finds the gates closed and he's pissed, which I don't understand why he's even remotely mad about that because, duh. <laughs> We're not I think he's mad in, that the capacity to defy him is more of what it is. Yeah, he's, he's pissed and he's like, I will kill every dog in the city. And he doesn't mean dog. Well, he means dog probably literally, but he's literally meaning he I means will kill everything. everybody if you don't. He's going to even squish the ants that had little Pymiron flags. He was like, uh, not even you. Fuck you. Yeah. He's pouring he's... water in their little ant hill. Boiling yeah. water, dude. You do. He's a cruel man. Yeah. I know. Not There's even an ants were left alive. There's a guy inside these gates here at Tiana. And he's like, well, I don't want to be killed. I don't want my family killed. I don't. Like, let's just solve don't this. Don't open the let's gates and you won't. Oh, he opened the gates. And guess what happened? The he fucking in. died? Yeah. But just him. Oh, shit. They left well, the city. that's cruel irony, kind of isn't it? For Roman centurions, yeah. He left that's the city. That's what you get, you spineless bastard. Let yeah. history remember you as the twat waffle that let all this happen. Poor dude. But yeah. You butt much. Killed. And they move on to the next city, Antioch. Yeah. So this city is in Syria, and it's one of the most important oh. cities in the Roman Empire. Zenobia sends her armies to defend the city. Also, a little bit of a side note. Zenobia is often called, in these romanticized versions, she's often called the warrior queen, Zenobia. Oh. And I think that's part of the, the romance and the mythos of it all. Uh, some historians think that she very well might have been you know, suited up to a certain degree and been on the field, but she's not sure. leading the troop. She's back out of the fight. So well, she's no, there but she's like nearby. sitting behind them being their yeah, mascot. Yeah, which is cool. Right? I mean, I mean yeah, is. better than not being there than eating fucking grapes whilst everyone's <laughs> galloping to death. Yeah, fucker. Grapes. Denethor. Uh, but her, her army's pretty rad, okay? Because it is multi-ethnic and therefore multi-skilled. Mm. Not that you can't have a, like, you know, not that, you know, in... Rome no, but they all came from but... their own specialties, because if they were multi-ethnic, they probably all came from different spots, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. So, yeah, that yeah. brings a wider variety of skill set there. Yeah. And so, I, I kind of thought of it like this, and I, and I know I'm moving out of time, this will really annoy the military history people, but it's like having an English longbowman. And then, mm. like, a Viking berserker, and then, like, a Mongolian horseman, and then a Roman centurion, and Persian war elephants. You know, they like, having yeah, these dude. sort of... Dude, you'd be unstoppable. And, like, you can put together a really great army. The only with... thing that would stop an Persians. army with those guys would be, like, nuclear war. Other than that, you've got no chance. And because in Palmyra, the trade was the main focus, they had a lot of money, and they could put that money into their warcraft. So they had resources really and they had the money for more resources yeah so they look like they're pretty 
pretty well set against Rome. When going against neighboring armies, Palmyran archers and heavy cavalry were, were particularly effective, and she got her heavy cavalry out to meet these Roman forces. Knowing how devastating Zenobia's heavy cavalry could be, Aurelian deploys a little tactic. He's like, okay, light cal cavalry. I want you to go across the river and pretend to engage them in a fight. When they're coming, getting closer, mm -hmm. lure them in, then turn and hightail it out of there. <laughs> That's Get ironic. There. Come back towards us, right? They do so, and the heavy cavalry is met by Roman archers, and oh, they shit. rain down the arrows. The skies go black kind of thing. And oh, anyone who was left standing was met then with the Testudo formation, the little turtle. That's where they get all their shields together and they get uh, up over the top. That would be a tortoise, Laurel. Fuck yeah. Terrestrial turtle. Like yeah. And then, boom, Antioch falls and Aurelian marches to the last Palmyrene stronghold before the capital city called Emesa. I mentioned earlier that Aurelian divided his forces and then marched 40,000 to Syria and then 40,000 to Egypt. And it sounded probably like a weird, unnecessary footnote to add in. But I say that to bring up the point that they were tired by this point. Mm -hmm. They've campaigned their whole way here. Yeah. They've gone all the way across and down. And they're pretty spent. I mean, to the point where they very nearly retreat. They want to be done. They're about to leave. And in the primary sources, we get, which get a little squirrely sometimes, mm -hmm. they talk about how there's this divine uh, like presence that moved through the men, and they, they rally, and they rise up, and they take the city. And they do. I mean, they rally and take the city, but uh, the, last, Shit, dude. the last stronghold before oh, fell. the capital. Final showdown. Boss fight. Zenobia has retreated back to her capital city, Palmyra. Tens of thousands of Roman soldiers are outside her city walls. She has provisions, so thankfully she's well supplied for a time. And she gets word out to Persia and she's like, hey guys, we need your help, stat. Like right now they're at our gates. To Persia. And she decides then to wait it well, out. She just repelled like a year ago. Yeah. Well, who? what's his face repelled a year ago? And they're going to help. Right. Yes, I'm thinking it's kind of like a enemy of my enemies sort of thing. Oh, is my friend? Yeah, I suppose so. Against Rome? Yeah. Everyone wants Rome to go down. She's like the popular girl that everybody hates. It's true. Yeah. We don't actually know how long the battle for Palmyra was. The Augustan history um, has a potential correspondence between the two leaders. The book I read uh, by the Charles River editors they think it might be fiction again to romanticize the situation, just make it more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and it is. <laughs> so I'm going to yeah. include some of the correspondence because it, it is fun. So I just want everyone to know that this might not have actually happened. But here we go. Aurelian essentially says, you should do what you should have done a long time ago and surrender all your jewels, gold, all your wealth belongs to the Roman Empire now. Your troops are ours. Your city is ours. and." You and your two sons can go live in a place of my choosing and live out the rest of your days there. Which actually is in line with what Rome usually did or often did with leaders. Just put them in yeah, exile. they were considered civilized. Hmm. Oftentimes, that's how they spoke about themselves. They were more right. civilized than those that they conquered. Yes. So here's the response. Quote, from Zenobia, Queen of the East, to Aurelian Augustus. You demand my surrender as though you were not aware that Cleopatra preferred to die a queen rather than remain alive, however high her rank. Yeah. Then she goes on to say, basically, my friends are coming and you're going to be sorry. Shit. So we're going to sit back and relax. You can take, you know, you can siege the city. You can, you can do all you want, but we're going to hang out here and you're going to bake and you're going to starve out in the desert sun. You may break yourself against my walls. Yeah. You will wash among these walls like the sea washes off of rock. You will fall before me. Oh, sorry. I was practicing my monologue. That was really good. Thank you. But at that point, all bets are off. Negotiations are off the table. Aurelian is like, cracking his knuckles. Yeah, I was going to say, he probably didn't take that so well. He's like, this is Rome. 
this as Rome. <laughs> yeah, right. So he's like, I siege mean, weaponry is our thing. Everything yeah, is Rome's thing. <laughs> <laughs> they do have some military stuff on lock. Now, are you ready for some Age of Empires nostalgia? Fucking okay. hit me with it. I love All that right. game. Hell yeah. We've got battering rams. We've got scorpions. We've got ballistas. Flammable projectiles. The city is in trouble after a time. What about the thing that be. when you got your castle, it like flung shit at them? The trebuchet? It's like a really How long do you say that again? Book. Trebuchet? Shit, That's girl. Right. I called it trebucked. Baby girl, you keep on calling it whatever you want. That's fine. A tabux. <laughs> I, I think the trebuchet is way more majestic than when I was like, yeah, the trebuch to thing. Uh, yeah, I'm a fuck you up. <laughs> and then you blow a hole in the wall with the little guys holding the barrels. Like, yeah, get yeah. fucked. Yeah. Good times, dude. So supplies dwindle. Any of the military reinforcements that she was talking about. When they arrived, they were stopped by the Roman forces, and a lot of them just joined in because they were like, yeah, this is oh, We don't want to like get involved with this. We're good. Zenobia escapes from Persia to try to get their help and like get to them, but she's caught. She's brought back to the city, and Shit. Palmyra officially falls. Damn. Now, here we go. Settle in. Everyone says a little bit something different for the end of her story. Oh. My book... Says oh, I that feel she like was... it was not good. <laughs> My book says that she blamed her court for encouraging the revolt, which is both rude and weird because I don't really have any. It was totally your to idea. Her. And then she turned them all over to Rome, who then executed them. So that's loyal. I was going to say, what the hell? Yeah. And Aurelian then ugh, turned his soldiers loose on the city, which is, if you know anything about roman history that's all you really need to say because you know everyone within said city all the worst things happen and um yeah so there's that but as for zenobia herself no one's really entirely sure of her fate so here's what everyone says the augustan history which is unreliable says that she was yeah. exiled because aurelian didn't think it would be polite to put a woman to death but that he did parade her, took her back to Rome, paraded her through the streets as a show of victory, and then put her up in a plush little palace down the road, which I don't hate. Like if that if if that was me, I'd be like, be, I'll take the, the shame. Be, that would be more bearable it. than yeah, being yeah. like, I don't know, like being handed over to soldiers. Mm -hmm. Right. Some say that she was taken to Rome and killed. One Roman historian, Zosimus, who we mentioned at the beginning, says that she was taken back to Rome, but on the way, her son drowned in the Bosphorus River. She was put on trial in the city. Her, uh, She was acquitted, and then she married a Roman senator and just lived out her days in the capital, which kind of fits in with the Augustan history. The, the historian Altabar, who is the Arab historian, doesn't talk about any of that and instead just gives this grand story about how she murdered a tribal chief on their wedding night and then es escaped the Euphrates River via a tunnel that was built ahead of time or something. What? It's wackadoodle. I, I stopped listening after a while. <laughs> I stopped reading it. I was like, I don't know she's what's going on here. But then she takes her own life and that's the, the fate of Queen Zenobia. Um, I'm not buying it, but there we go. As Damn, for dude. Palmyra the city, it went back to being a merchant city after being sacked by Rome and retaken. Later down the road, there was another revolt by a small group of people, which led to a very violent, very harsh backlash from Rome. And after that, the city was never the same. It was destroyed uh, quite a bit. A lot of people were killed. Mm. And uh, it kind of just languished there in the desert. The Roman Empire fell in the 5th century and the Byzantine Empire, after it never really felt the need to fully revive the city. Mm -hmm. After many centuries, the city became a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it is filled with ancient history, artifacts, antiquities, Roman ruins, um, these Palmyran, Palmyran tombs. A lot of history there. Yeah. 
In 2015, many temples and tombs from that time period were destroyed by ISIS. And I know that when ISIS was moving in, there were a lot of scholars in the city that were trying to do everything they could to load up the trucks with the antiquities, the history, just trying to move out anything that was movable, get it out of the city. And from what I understand, they were successful. Mm. Um, Unfortunately, there was one Syrian archaeologist who stayed behind. He was uh, very famous in the city. And then when ISIS found out who he was, Mm. they imprisoned and tortured him for about a month, asking him where all the treasures and all the gold and all the antiques were. Um, and And he said, like, there is none. Like, I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you it's where it gone. is. I'm not telling you where it went. There's nothing here for you to, like, I don't know if he spit in their face, but I, I like to. He did, dude. He, he did. did. that spirit, you know? Um, but they did murder him. But um, I, of course I don't want to bring did. everyone down, but I think it's really important to try and, like, point out these people who uh, are trying to save history from those who try to destroy and erase it. Yeah. And, um, but some good news. Lift it back up again. When Syria regained control of their country in 2016, They were thankful to find that they thought a lot of it was destroyed and couldn't ever be repaired or restored, but it wasn't quite as bad as they imagined, and they're trying to do some work to renovate these sites. So, Oh, good. That's currently where it is. But uh, yeah, Palmyra, a story of Zenobia, queen of the Palmyrene Empire. Damn. Hmm. I almost wanted her to succeed, like all that effort only to just be... Yeah, she uh, she basically rose and fell within a five year period, like less than five years. And that's how we know her in the history books. Damn, mm-hmm. it wasn't long lived, was it? No. Hello, friends. My name is Patrick Little, host of a Little History podcast. If you like to learn about history yeah, a little differently, then the Little History Podcast has you sorted. Nothing is off limits as we tackle some of the well-known and not so well-known stories from various mythologies and folklore from around the world. So drink them if you got them and join us for a bit of shit talking and a lot of fun. My name is Patrick Little and this is a Little History Podcast. It's our history, but like you've never heard it before. Hey, Smoke Circle, how are you doing? I hope you're having a great time and uh, learning a lot so far. I hope you had some fun with the meteoric rise and uh, subsequent fall of Queen Zenobia, queen of the Palmyrene Empire, and her stand against ancient Rome. If you're enjoying yourself so far, please rate, review on whatever platform you are listening on. Not only do we love hearing from you, but rating and reviewing, all those sort of things like that are incredible for helping little indie podcasts like ours move up in the charts and get heard by more amazing people like yourself. Share this episode with a friend or on social media. And speaking of social media, join the online smoke circle. Keep up with what we're doing the other days of the week when we're not here with you. Over there, we share news and updates as well as history one hitters, where we talk about some cool thing we learned about in history and we wanted to share that with you. All our social media accounts are directly linked in the episode show notes below. So just scroll down and there we are. Up next, Katie is completely changing gears with some really fun pop culture history. So let the nostalgia and the nerdiness flow, my friends, and let's puff, puff, pass it. On to part two. All right, so mine is couldn't be further from yours. You did have a little bit of a foreshadowing to mine though oh when you did like theme music you're like Ba-da-da-da. shut up are we doing like batman or something like that dude i wish batman will have his day but okay. it is not this day i fucking okay. will never miss a lord of the rings moment <laughs> let that be known <laughs> if you hate lord of the rings this is not for you so- <laughs> um all right set the scene listen yeah. here we go mm-hmm. A poor, sickly orphan boy uh, is bitten by a radioactive spider and as a result is then able to climb walls and has superhuman strength, senses, and agility. Does it sound familiar? Spider-Man. Right? Well, you would think at least this is what would become then Spider-Man, right? It sounds a little bit different than what we're used to. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, it is essentially the same so in 1962 
Stanley and Steve Ditko wrote a filler story for an anthology series that had long since been, well, now it's long since been canceled. At the time, it was called Amazing Fantasy, and this was number 15. So this is the precursor to Spider-Man. Also, oh, wow. I guess I should probably precursor all of this. So as of August 4th, I believe it is, Spider-Man turned 60 last year. So <laughs> there was a lot going on last year. So this is a belated 60th birthday, even though it's his 61st birthday. We're celebrating yeah. all year long. So 60 slash 61 birthday, that's how it's going to be. Yeah. So <laughs> here we're we about are. those birthday years and birthday months. Yeah. We are. So this is the first instance, this being Spider-Man as a written, uh, yep, my brain will start working here. This is the danger of doing weed, people. <laughs> You'll, you will side quest hard. So really in literature, this is the first instance, especially comic literature, let's be very specific here, of the main protagonist being a youth. Up mm -hmm. until then, it's been very masculine men with Superman and Captain America and yeah. Batman and Iron Man. Man, 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 man. It's in the fucking name. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, the, so this protagonist, right, is a young teenage boy who is not relegated to the role of sidekick. Because oftentimes you have, like, Superboy or Crypto the Superdog or you mm -hmm. have robin and batgirl and stuff like that which batman and robin work beautifully i'm not here to diss that whole dynamic because they are the dynamic duo but in this instance it's the spider-man show and it's not about which still called spider-man right in the name but it's a young teenage boy it's a, a youth a ute <laughs> what's a ute <laughs> yeah so he has his own merit as a hero. He's not relying on someone to be, yeah. you know, his guardian. Peter Parker has no superpowered uh, help to aid his journey. You know, like I said, Robin has Batman. He can be like, dude, I'm like having a rough time right now. And he'd be like, yeah, man, I feel you. Let's talk. Like, what's up? Well, I don't know how much of a therapist Batman would be, like, worthy of, but whatever. <laughs> I don't feel like he'd be the best therapist. He'd be like, you no. just need to go punch stuff and bring people to justice to feel better. You'd be like, I mean, or a cup of hot chocolate. <laughs> Maybe a cuddle. Maybe just let me talk to you about something. Maybe things, just a I'm hug. Maybe I just need a yeah. hug. My parents fucking died, dude. Like, maybe I just yeah. need a fucking hug and some Kleenex. Maybe a dog. <laughs> oh. So right out of the gate, Especially with Spider-Man, we are hit with the inevitable uh, coming-of-age element of this story, which is one of my favorite, because it does have the, the growing pains, we will call it. He makes a decision to become a TV personality originally. This is what the original one was. Yours and mine, I think, were used to him like doing wrestling or something like that. I don't know, something. Yeah, that's the first thing I think he, of, yeah. He chooses to be popular versus a hero, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is what kind of most any of us would do honestly look at any tiktok sensation or whatnot now that would be spider-man of his day yeah. so instead of selflessly dedicating himself to the betterment of society like batman and superman do they're like i must be just as full which is now a word um but <laughs> he's like okay. you know i'm gonna have fun but he's a kid that's what we do you know he makes the decision not to stop a thief in an act of crime and several days later mm -hmm. his uncle is murdered by that very same person so there's a very much the uh our actions have consequences right that whole coming of age idea we all make these silly mistakes that we wish we hadn't and we learn from them it brings about the birth of with great power comes great responsibility there is that whole our actions have consequences same idea right Mm -hmm. But, that, I mean, that's something that I bet you, you could go and say it in any country and they would know who to, you mantra know, give that to. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the mantra that we all know and love. Uh, it denotes the idea that if you have the ability to do, do something, you should do it for the good of others. You should act mm -hmm. selflessly, right? At least that's what his uncle wanted. 
So despite Martin Goodman, the publisher at Marvel at the time, being not receptive and frankly slightly horrified about the spider motif. Oh no. He was like, this is a terrible fucking idea. Which I get it. Spiders, most people are afraid of spiders. I sleep with one who, dude, side quest for five seconds. Sure. My tarantula taps on its tank now. I was like, what the fuck is that? Dude, he's Morse coding me. He, she, they is Morse coding me. I was like, whoa, I don't know Morse card, but if I did, I don't know that I'd want to know what you were saying to me. Being slightly horrified by the spider motif, right. uh, he was like, he was not a fan of it, right? But Stanley and Steve Ditko, they forged ahead. They're like, no, we're doing it. We believe in this. It's going to work. So, right? They give it a couple more tries. And the readers responded so powerfully mm. to Spider Man. Um, by the time we are here today, not only did it bring about an ongoing title, so earned its own spot to have its own comic, which is a big deal. Comic characters almost always star in a comic series before they get their own. So Deadpool, right. very popular one, was in New Mutants 98. Was tested out. When they're successful, then you get your own. You gotta earn it, though. It's not just handed to you. Unless you're fucking Batman, but that's fucking Batman, so. Batman will have his day. Don't you worry. So, not only has it brought about its own ongoing title, several television series, video games, several uh, movie adaptions, I think we all know. It even has a Broadway musical. What the fuck? Yeah, it Batman sure does. doesn't have a Broadway Again. musical, nor will he yeah. ever. Dude. Whoa, hold on, idea, side quest. Could you imagine the, did you see the the genetic opera that I always loved as a teenager from the Saw movie? Yeah, Repo. Re Repo. Did you mm -hmm. like it, or is it too campy for you? Um, I like camp. I appreciated it for what it was for other people, but it's not something I would want to see again, necessarily. Got you. Well, I was going to say, like, Repo. Batman, Broadway, Gothic Opera, Batman. Yeah. It could work. Yeah, that would be what I imagine as well. Something like Amen. That. Darkness. Let's get on that. <laughs> Why does Batman do all of his crime fighting at night? Is this a joke? Yeah. Or is this like, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Why does Batman do all of his crime fighting at night? Because if he did it during the day, he'd have weird and obvious tan lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he sure would. People would be like, uh, Mr. Wayne, are you, like, did, were you, Don't worry did, about did you abscond with another ballet company again and go snorkeling? I don't know. Like, what are you doing? Right. He's like, no. They're like, you seem to be always kind of Wrong. My spray tan went spot. wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that would leave or a lot he'd of have questions. to like do bronzer every day to make it to even it out. Alfred, your bronzer, sir. Just tans. He has to end up getting like a spray tan booth in the in the Wayne Mansion. Dude, in the in the Bat Cave. So when he gets out, he just walks in, gets evened out, good to go, goes to bed. Yeah, he goes down like a little tube or something like that. Because he's got to take the bat he's... suit off. You know that mother trucker is. Uh, <sighs> Circumcised, by the way. Sorry, not to left field you, but they I'm just sorry? released. Yeah, Blake has it. Of course he does. Uh, has the one they, I don't know, they released an illustration of his penis. So it's like, I hate to be a downer, but I don't actually give a shit what Batman's dick looks like, dude. Like, no. it does zero crime fighting ability. Or maybe it is the most justiceful <laughs> dick I've ever known in my life, but I highly doubt it. Yeah. Wait, was he circumcised? I don't remember. I think he was. And what did Blake say to me? He goes, the man's hung like a horse. I was like, he's Batman. And if you're going to draw, you know, anatomy, you're going to make it. Like, that's why women have, like, you don't the draw biggest small titties. The yeah. Biggest, yeah, the biggest muscles, Absolutely. the biggest butts, tiniest waists. Yeah, that's. Might as well have that's a big an dick obvious too. one. Do you think it's like a dick of justice? Probably. Anyway, now that I've side quested yeah. us so hard. Yeah. <laughs> It smells like a weird old bat suit. Yeah. Anyway, so oh back to Spider Man. In the March yep. of 1963, The Amazing Spider Man Volume 1 was released. So a year later, he earns okay. his own title. 
fact, it quickly became the mainstay of this now emerging Marvel universe. This is where it started, was in the 60s. So not only was Spidey a huge draw himself as a character, people really related to him, he had what makes every great series in history an all-star cast, not just him. Mm. So Gwen Stacy, Mary Jane, J.J. fucking Jameson. Everybody yeah. knows that guy. Like, come on. What a supporting character to have. Yeah. Oh, Blake says he was uncircumcised. Okay. Sorry, I had to know. <laughs> I literally had to, like... Bruce Wayne. Yeah, nice job. Nice job, Bruce. Bruce's right? parents, I guess. I don't know. Tom. Tom and Martha. Tom and Anywho. Martha. <laughs> so, Jay Jameson. And, of course, all-star villain cast. Doc Ock. Sandman. Craven the Hunter, who gets glossed over a lot. A little bit of mm-hmm. Craven love here. And my personal Marvel favorite is the Green Goblin. Yes, I love the Green Goblin. He, I have so much Green Goblin shit, it's a little bit unnecessary. But as Marvel villains go, I've always loved him. I think he has a lot of what kind of makes the Joker popular to people, is that kind of chaotic evilness. You're not mm-hmm. exactly sure what's going to happen next. Right. I've always loved that. Yeah. So the two most popular comic book characters that today, well, in general, in history, at this day of time, they have stellar casts, right? That's what makes them special. So kind of gave it away, sort of. But the most famous of them are Spider-Man, and I'm sure you can guess the second one. Within the Spider-Man universe? No, in, in comics in general. Oh, I'm sorry. Spider-Man Who has, and as Superman, villains, probably. more iconic than them. Oh, it's it's Superman? Batman. Oh, Batman. Okay. With Joker, Poison Ivy, Mr. Freeze, like all that. My personal favorite uh, from his is um, fucking the Louisiana guy, the Cajun guy. Uh, Gambit? No. Gambit's an X-Men. What are you talking about? No, no, no. The Crocodile. What's his name? Why can't I think of it? Liz. Liz Batman's. He's got a little crocodile bad guy. Ugh. I'm going to look it up. Hold on. Okay. Crocodile villain. Yeah. What's his name? Killer Croc. Duh. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know it, right? He's Cajun. I don't know if I've ever liked this. Oh, he's Cajun, dude. The best accent. I think. Oh, absolutely. Them, yeah. I love him. Mm-hmm. Anywho, I always love Killer Croc. Yeah. Um. So, the, what Spider-Man and Batman have in common, they have some of the most iconic villains, right? Uh. So, people who don't read comics can probably tell you about some of them Mm -hmm. they don't read comics but they'll know who green goblin is they'll know who joker is they'll know those things they'll know who harley quinn is even though she was more of a batman the animated series edition but right anywho so spider-man's popularity grew so quickly they had to expand and have crossovers in the Marvel Universe because they just couldn't get enough Spider-Man. I mean, when I tell you the response was powerful to Spider-Man, I mean it. It was uniquely powerful. Because I'm not sure they had a single Marvel character who took off like he did. So he... Spider-Man is special. Um, So crossovers such as Marvel Team-Up that began in March of 1972 and it ran for 150 issues and it paired Spidey with almost every single high-profile Marvel hero out there at the time. Which is a big deal. It's not something that was done before. I want to say Marvel may have done it before DC, but I would have to double... I'd have to fact-check that. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure that that's correct. So in 1976... The Spectacular Spider-Man became the fourth ongoing series to include Spider-Man along with the original The Amazing Spider-Man, right? The one we all know and love, Mm -hmm. uh, that carried the character and the franchise through the next two decades. So, 76, fast forward ahead, we've arrived in the 90s. Coming into the 1990s, a new writer was introduced to the series whose unique drawing style drew fans to the character like never before. See if you can name who this is. Uh, this. Ooh, what kind of hint could I give you to him? Um, I'm going to say the name and you're going to know it right away. Oh. He had special editions. So the two, I think it was the two that I'm thinking of, introduced the uh, Black Spidey suit. Okay. 
and he had two issues that came into the comic shop at one point and me and like two other guys were like looking at it and like warning over it and everyone wants the first appearance of black man black suit spider-man right and it's like which is fine I took the one that had the hobgoblin on it because I prefer the goblins. Goblins are my favorite. But mm -hmm. I wanted the one that was illustrated by this guy. And his name is Todd McFarlane. Yes. Yeah. The, okay. the yeah. Todd McFarlane. The Todd McFarlane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, know, I was trying yeah. to think. Like, I'm like, I don't know that many animators' names and writers' names off the top of my you head. You know anyway. this one. There's a few big ones that I'm like, oh, yeah, like I know who that is. But uh, that one is the one I know of the 90s, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I thought he's, um, yeah, he's Spawn's guy. Yeah, that's exactly what I was just about to say. I'm like, because I, I know him from Spawn. Not that I've read Spawn, but because I know that his name's attached to it. He all, yeah. is Spawn, dude. <laughs> yeah. Just, I mean, he is like, I'm pretty sure he's like the OG creator of it. Like, Spawn is his baby. So this yeah, is when, yeah. Spawn is when he went from working for other people to having his own. You know, like how Stan Lee created Spider-Man and Iron Man? Mm-hmm. Spawn is his Spider-Man. So, right. it's a big deal. So, moving into the early 2000s, it saw a lot of growth for Spider-Man, story-wise, because, I mean, a lot of new technology, number one. It's a very different world from the 1960s. And he was forced to confront big, monumental disasters such as 9-11 and otherworldly mm -hmm. problems that uh, brought a limit to his power and limitations, uh, which, for me, makes him seem more human than before. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. Spider-Man of the 60s, the 70s, there's nothing, your heroes, there's nothing they can't do, right? And nothing they can't stop. No problem unsolvable for them. That's, we're in a new era, especially with those big disasters like that. Yeah. Uh, and they touch on those in the Avengers movie a lot, if you've noticed that. Like, when a bomb goes off and kills a bunch of people, and then the news picks up on it and whatnot. But I, that mm -hmm. representation is always very interesting to me, because that's a very modern-day take on comic characters. Right, yeah. Um, they are not infallible. They are human. They mm -hmm. do have... Well, they are... Yeah, <laughs> they're human. human -like emotionally. In yeah. Emotionally. You know, they have empathy you know mm -hmm. they're not all powerful you can't stop everything you can't also around this time is when a series called the ultimate spider-man was released which yeah. broke continuity for the first time so this allowed writers to go back into the original spidey story reimagine it a little bit and bring it current so this is probably stuff mm -hmm. that you and i are more familiar with when we see spider-man i want to say this is more of what that first movie the toby mcguire movie was based okay. off of it was okay. kind of more of like the ultimate spider-man arc um just you know bring him more current make him more relatable for teens of the day which is kind of you have to do that you know because that is someone that they it's a character they latch onto and then grow with right incidentally this is also my first comic book ever it wasn't just the book, but it was the trade paperback from the Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, excuse me, the Ultimate Spider-Man. He is amazing, but this is the Ultimate Spider-Man. <laughs> it was the first comic book ever gifted to me, and it started my love for comics. Hmm. Dude, I know. Like, as I was, like, writing this, I was, like, tearing up, like, real. And I was like, dude, pull yourself together. Um, yeah. First comic ever, which makes one is why I did this story is make Spider-Man very special to me because yes, Batman is my, my, my bow because Batman, the character I knew first, but I didn't read Batman comics. I grew up with the animated series. I grew up with yeah. Batman beyond. I grew up with the justice league because yeah. I was like, these are all cartoons where if you saw them and grew up with them, they were very influential. Again, mm -hmm. Batman, the animated series is where Harley Quinn was created. She was a side character on there. They liked her so much that everyone demanded she come back. They put her in the comics. You know, these are very iconic things. But the first comic book I ever picked up, I ever read, I ever experienced was The Ultimate Spider-Man. I think I still have it in, like, we're in my basement right now. There's boxes here. I It's in here somewhere. So it is among us. Um, but, so it started my love for comics. And eventually, incidentally would then lead me to meet Blake. 
the love of my life, who I think is sitting above us right now. Oh. So he's up there. <laughs> oh. Dude, isn't that intense? Gifted by one of our very dear friends. Yeah. Who hopefully will be on at some point. Maddie. Trying to have him on the show at some point to talk about these sorts of things, actually. Talk about That comedy. would be great. Dude, and does actually... he know that? Does he know? <laughs> yeah. No, we've does about he he's... know that the Spider-Man story? I think so. Does he's he? to find out. I'm going to make him listen. <laughs> like, yeah, he, he needs to know. Listen. Dude, it's intense. Like, but, like, as I was typing it, I was like, <sighs> fucking waterworks but like, that's... he's cutting onions in here yeah I, but that's that was my introduction to comics as well too like i knew x-men from the animated series and then also mm -hmm. the arcade game and stuff like that like that was how i knew the x-men x-men um but uh it wasn't until i was like 19 when i was introduced to the x-men again but in comic form i read yeah. the dark phoenix saga well, and that's I a good it. one i think that was gifted to me as well from the same person so. nice yeah dude we like hold it in our hearts man we hold it in our hearts we do we do absolutely this uh, hot toddy is now not so bad and i think that means that it's getting comforting <laughs> good news for you you only have about a third left mm. so in 2015 the mantle of spider-man was claimed by miles morales after the events of secret wars uh -huh. secret wars uh, he's considered one of the biggest Marvel breakout characters of the 21st century. And for good reason. Personally, I'm going to tell you, I owned almost every... Until comic shops started dropping like flies around me. I own mm -hmm. almost every uh, book in his arcs because I liked the writing so much. Because he was such okay. an interesting character and because he was so... There's a lot there. I mean, it's good. It's very good. Sad to say, not every arc, not every reimagining, not everything captures your heart, right? It just isn't how it goes. But when you find a good one with good writing, good character development and all that, they are very special. Spider-Man has also enjoyed tremendous success on the silver screen, not being limited to the comic pages. Yeah. He never will be, because now I think he's a staple. Uh, the first of which being when Sony brought Spider-Man to the big screen in 2002, where it grossed Huge. 800 million worldwide. Mm -hmm. So that Huge. that was the beginning of comic book movies. Mm -hmm. Truly, the ones that not to you know Christopher Reeves, Spy uh, Superman, all that. Fantastic. Perfect. Actually, of the Superman movies, I still love to rewatch those. I like them so much. There is uh, there there's there's uh they're very special you know there's a very specialness about them but of the modern era now we have the technology that we have and all that that spider-man was mind-blowing for someone my age because i would have been seven six seven eight when that came out i saw it in theaters did you end up seeing it in theaters oh yeah okay it was me and so uh, miguel who went I remember oh, okay. he took me because he said he said he said I was sitting all the way at the end of my seat, like staring avidly. I first of all, again, as a child, I love Spider Man, so that helps. But yeah, it was just it was amazing. And Willem Dafoe, Oh, Willem oh. Friend, really? He's oh isn't god, he is the friend. He's just the best. Oh my god, the coolest. He's incredible. Do you know what he said? I watched a um interview with him and he said do you know of all the fans who still come up to me or, or the only fans who come up to me to talk to me are the boondock fans he goes nobody oh. else from anything he said it's always if a fan comes up to me to say something it's a boondock saints fan and i was like also a great movie and a lot of fun and he was fantastic in that but uh oh, i think that's kind of interesting that right it's not for him being the green goblin I know. I th or anything else that he's great are, in, right? You know? Oh, dude, have you seen him in Togo? Listen, first of all, listen to our episode of Togo, then go watch it. Yeah. Uh, no, that shit slaps. That's so good. He is Willem DeFriend. Let's change his name. <laughs> dude, Willem seriously. DeFriend. He's so underrated. I love him. He's amazing. So, obviously, Spider-Man has become one of the elite few of the Marvel Universe now, right? Owned by Walt Disney Company, and he has world 
worldwide renown and success. It doesn't matter what country you're in. They know who Spider-Man is. Spider-Man has grown exponentially, right, into what is today uh, for the younger generation. I mean, Spider-Man, just pop, just as popular, yes, but differently. Again, new generation, new problems. But, you know, what's interesting for the new generation, it's not Peter Parker who's Spider-Man. It's Miles Morales. Mm-hmm. You know? It's, uh, there, there's even a version of Spider-Man because it's grown. There's so many different titles, offshoots of it now is where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. There is one where Gwen Stacy becomes her own version of Spider-Man. So if you've seen the, what's the first one, the animated Spider-Man, what, Into the Multiverse or Into the... Multiverse, yeah. Yeah, okay. Gorgeous movie. Oh my goodness. Beautiful. That is how the Miles Morales comics are written. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. I thought some of his writers were on that project, but I could be wrong. Um, very good, very accurate representation of how those comics are made, specifically that arc. Um, yeah. And he has a cool suit, too. You've seen it, right, where it's black with the red stripes? So cool. I'll have to go look, but my little guy is starting school this week, like starting kindergarten or pre-K this week. I was like, we're at kindergarten already? Yeah. I just panicked. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Going to big boy school. And uh, I was like, okay, it's your first backpack. You can pick out whatever backpack you want. And, and he, he doesn't pick out Spider-Man. He picked out Spider-Man. Holy fuck. He's like, Spider-Man. And I was like, do you know who Spider-Man is? And he goes, yeah, I want spider And I was like, it's yours, my dude. And it's the Miles Morales. It's super duper shiny. It's just probably part of what got his attention. It's like chrome almost. Yeah. It's really reflective. But uh, yeah, it's. I'm pretty sure it's Miles Morales, Spider-Man the red and the suit yeah so cute my nephew is so cool Mm -hmm. (laughs) i don't think you understand how much you just put on me to process as an aunt right now which is probably why i feel like this like i'm kind of run down but uh yeah because you're stressed out yeah child's getting on a bus without you there's a lot of reasons to be stressed right now sorry i didn't mean to make that worse we'll send the cat Mm -hmm. with him in his bag it'll go well I'm going to just drink more hot toddy because now I'm, it's drinkable. There you go. See, it's comforting. It is comforting. So what's really special to me about Spider-Man is um, much like, not that I think Robin Hood is a myth, but much like what's called the Robin Hood myth. If you haven't mm-hmm. listened to our episode on Robin Hood, you should do it. It's very interesting. Um, eye-opening, let us say. Yeah. And it's Nottingham. Not Nottingham. <laughs> Nottingham Forest. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. It, you know what? If you're American, they that's how you're going to pronounce it. have a song called Not in Nottingham, okay? I'm not going to give it up completely. Just because Disney fucked it up. It's not my fault. It's only because I'm married to an Englishman. That's all. You know, I, I know. You have... I, Blake said something to me about Arsenal playing the other day, and I was like, oh yeah, who are they playing? He goes, Nottingham. And I was like, mm-hmm. well done, my lad. He goes, yeah, thank you. Blake. <laughs> Give him a little little pat rub on the back for me. It'll probably be on his butt, but yeah. Okay, I'm just say that's from Laurel. It's not weird. I'm like, oh, okay. I'll do it on his little belly. I'm not sure what's more weird and feeling. <laughs> that's okay. Hey, wherever, wherever you do it, just say it's from me. Uh... <laughs> Let's let it be a little game. <laughs> the Robin Hood myth. What I mean right. by that is, is at a certain point... If you listen to the episode, my opinion is that the mantle of Robin Hood was taken up and led on through the centuries with him, right? A mantle that is taken up, and I think that's what it means to be Robin Hood, what Robin Mm -hmm. Hood means to the people. Spider-Man is much the same way. He was created, and he's been recreated and reborn for the next generation, and the next generation, and the next, and the next. You know, he's not a monolith he is this evolving living thing almost if that makes right, sense yeah i see yeah, you're saying yep. it, it's very it's it's interesting especially for this particular character because as i told you that joke earlier about the weird and obvious tan lines you know what race and color batman is right yeah mm-hmm. if you see him spider-man wears a full mask So we'll get to that. I'm skipping a bullet point, though. Okay. So this character's inception 
was from two struggling comic artists because they're just starting to hit it big, right? Spider-Man was really the one that pulled this out, right? This was a big one. So he, the inception of this idea, two struggling comic artists whose story and character that they created has resonated across decades. I mean, the reach is far. Uh, And again, this is where we come to, that is what's special about Spider-Man. Yeah. is you can't see the face under the mask. Spider-Man can be anybody. And that's what's very special about it. He can be any race, any gender, any age, any culture. Every kid and person can see a little bit of themselves represented in Spider-Man. And that's what makes him very special like that. Because Mm -hmm. when you think of Iron Man, it is Tony Stark. It is this person or it is this person. Spider-Man is, is, is the youth man. (laughs) Yeah. You know, we can all see ourselves as Spider-Man. And that, in honor of Spider-Man's belated 60th Uh, birthday from last year. (laughs) Happy 61st birthday. Happy 61st birthday. First birthday, Spidey. I know, dude. That was a heavy one. I'm gonna not gonna lie. There's a ton of times where I had to take a breath and be like, "Don't fucking cry on camera." <laughs> oh, even I'm not immune to the feels, bro. Sometimes it, those feels happen. It a lot with Spider Man. Spider Man is a very emotional topic for me. Hmm. It, it's again. As I said, there's a lot to it, so. Well, and as you pointed out, too, like, it's something that resonated with so many people mm-hmm. that, you know, it's. It, I feel like everybody's got a little piece of themselves that they might see in that story, or at least mm-hmm. be able to empathize with. And, uh, yeah, no, I think, I, I think the fact that you did have feelings while writing that, I think, is very important. Yeah, dude, comic, I just gotta, like, hold my yeah. tears back, man. Yeah. Can't be not looking metal. <laughs> it's okay, guys. Me. Even metal heads cry. You won't rust, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, that's that's good. Thank you for that. And that's something that I think is really interesting is um not only like just pop culture history, I think is really interesting in general. Mm-hmm. You know, um because it's not of one how... we do super often here either. No, and I feel like we should do a little bit bit more of we, it but we, we do we of it i think yeah. once a quarter is good <laughs> yeah just i mean it's so mind. current it's hard to find stuff it's very interesting history and i think it can connect uh i mean connect into the rest of history right it's not like mm-hmm. a separate thing because there are stories within comics that can um, well, as you mentioned, like nine eleven, for example, that's the first mm-hmm. thing that comes to my head. Like that's something Captain that America's people written would... around World War Two. Those are real historical events, right? Written into the comics. You know, right, they right. they and, play uh, off of her history that exists mm-hmm. for us. Which is something I want to have a discussion with with people who know more about that than I do. I think because I think it'd be really fascinating. Um, I know the X Men current series of X Men. They're doing a lot of really interesting stuff with. Um, just really kind of talking about like, and this has always been the case with the mutants is like mm-hmm. they're quote unquote other, you know, and, and um, yep. persecuted as um, somebody who, you know, doesn't belong and they, they shouldn't even exist. And the sentinels for one thing, like the sentinels right. are trying to kill off the mutants. And, um, you know, that has Speaking a lot of parallels of I think, to our current events and some yeah. things too. Right. You know, like people I think can see themselves in these mutants who are just trying to, like they are who they are. They didn't choose that necessarily. They didn't you know, ask I mean, to like, be here. That's just the what they were born as. That way. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any exceptions. I don't want to make too broad of a statement, but I mean, you know, and, we're and speaking just in like, broad hey, strokes we right just now. Want to survive and live our lives. But I think, uh, I think his like comic books, in you know, of themselves, can be written off as like a nerdy or dorky thing, and um, you know, shouldn't get a time of day for. Most people, because they're like, eh, whatever. It's it's, it's pictures, it's pictures yeah. you know. It's pic- whatever. It's more than that, though. But there it, is, it is art yeah. that goes into that. There's story writing that goes into it, and then, and everybody, it it takes a team because there is the 
drawer, the illustrator, the inker, the person who does the, uh, you know, the planning and all that. Sorry, we're being joined by a feline who I'm not sure how you got down here through the closed door, but there she is. <laughs> Little bastard. Her daddy might have let her down mm -hmm. just to be like, hey, let's wrap things up. <laughs> Fiend. Uh -huh. So, but yeah, that I mm -hmm. think... Comics is also a good way to pull people into literature. I I mean I know I know people who they don't necessarily read books mm -hmm. like you know like Pride and Prejudice or whatever, right? But uh, they read comics voraciously and and um, it, having those conversations with people about like what they're reading and what they're getting out of it is right. the same, you know. And there's still storytelling. Oh yeah, and uh, you know whether it has pictures or that's short or long this the story can still be there that that exploration into the human condition and you know what it what it means to just kind of be a part of this big web of the world you know no mm -hmm. pun intended for spider-man tonight but uh you know i i think that's equally as important and if that's what gets you to read you know, and that's what gets you into it. Absolutely. Just do well, it. Well, again, like I said, it touches on history. It touches mm -hmm. on pop culture. It talks about current events. It There's a lot to it. Comics cool. are not just, you know, I mean, I Here, mean that's how, what today. led me yeah. to the love of my life. And connects us as friends, mm -hmm. you know, something to talk about, like a community yeah. in which, you know, people can go to their, well, could have gone to their lo local comic book shop and game shop and connect with other people that are reading the same things or can say, Hey, if you like that, you'll like this thing. It's like, and it's like the library. I love the library. Me but, too. Uh, you know, and it's like that for comic people would be like, Hey, and it's a little bit like more inclusive game. in that people who have a harder time reading, which is funny for me as someone who like is really not great and has really struggles with like ADHD as far as like, even like working is hard for me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like I, I have a lot of those issues. Um, you can read comics and not have the best attention span ever. Mm -hmm. It's perfect for that. And you can still get the literary uh, benefit out of it and all that. Mm -hmm. So that's a really great bridge to get for those of us who maybe don't think like everybody else does. Yeah. Uh, that's great. That's yeah, hugely appreciative, which is funny because I'm, that's one of the few things I can do despite my inability to process things like a normal human being. Um, whatever normal is anyway. Um, but I can read novels, but it it's not lost on me that that's hard for other people who struggle with these attention issues right. and the brain's always working and whatnot and you're side questing constantly. Listen, side quests are my specialty. You're so good at it. Oh, sadly. <laughs> I think it drives those around me crazy, but I... uh appreciate the patience from everybody i know it's not always easy <laughs> oh no, that's good that was fantastic katie thank you so much for bringing that tonight to the smoke circle so we could discuss absolutely some, i mean it's fun stuff but there's also like real heart to it the well. relevance mm -hmm. yeah. well, i hope you all enjoyed it because i feel very strongly about spider-man uh, i actually see so that wasn't my first I think the only Spider-Man comic I own is actually from the same person that gave you yours. Uh -huh. And uh, it's when Barack Obama was elected president. And there's oh, that's a right. picture of him on the front. And it's like, I think Spider-Man. Yeah. Spider-Man. Spider saying something like, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Nice job, Mr. President. Or something like that. Like, he's kind of saying something. He's in the, in the frame of the, the cover. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And I have that. I have a few other things. I don't have like a massive collection or anything, but I have a few. I have the few first appearance of the Iron Spider in comics. Oh. Iron Spider suit. Uh huh. So one where he gets the legs that come out and he actually has like eight legs at that point. Oh, yeah. It's really cool. I got to meet the guy who inked it in and he signed it. No, no, no. I met both. I met the guy who wrote it and the guy who inked it in at C2E2. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And then I have my Hobgoblin Todd McFarlane Spider Man. Iron Spider, definitely a big one for me. I would love to have had Todd McFarlane sign my Spider-Man, but I'm not sure I'll be meeting him anytime soon. If you want to come onto the podcast, feel free. Hey, Mr. If McFarlane. you're bored and or have nothing else going on, I own all of the Spawn ships. 
Yeah, you I sure do. I had so much spawn that he has a spot stacked up next to all my boxes because of all of the comics in my life. The one that I still get delivered to me from a friend of mine who still orders comics is Spawn. Yeah. So you're welcome, Todd McFarlane. <laughs> come on. Come on with it. Indeed. Slide into those DMs. DMs oh my God, we should. <laughs> Come do spawn. Like this guy isn't real. Us. Who the fuck does this guy think he is? Well, that'd be amazing. <laughs> oh, hashtag, oh, that's... hashtag, hashtag! Everybody, get it on there. Yeah, bring Drag him down. down. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that was that was really great and uh, so much fun. So much fun for all of us. I think. Thank you, Katie. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you so much. We hope you all had a great time. I. No, I did, despite how, uh, I hope I don't sound too awful, but despite how generally crap I feel, I've had a fantastic time with you all tonight. And uh, well done to um, to the Englishman for his hot toddy delivery. Um, hopefully I sleep so great. You're <laughs> so funny. going to. I oh, can't even begin to tell you how comforted. <laughs> You're going to fall asleep feeling like warm arms are cradling you oh that's what i want that's how i sleep with hot toddies i don't know how oh. you do but that's how i sleep with hot toddies i can't really be touched when i'm sleeping but like up to the point where i fall asleep like please hold me hot toddy should i just call you todd hot todd <laughs> yeah yeah sorry i'm just being really weird with my cup which is just sitting there like this as an inanimate object i'm flirting with it which is so gross um anyways so i want to be hell how we should just end this show now shouldn't i Oh, I mean, you know, sometimes these moments are the ones I appreciate the most. <laughs> oh, God. Hot Todd. Anyway, so uh, me and uh, Hot Todd are going to go get snuggled up and, and well, I'm going to finish him and then <laughs> they'll get, get settled in bed. Oh, my God, it's even worse. It's getting worse. Okay, I'm going to just end the show. I am a uh, bad hey. influence on you. Oh, bourbon is crazy. All right. Yeah, it um, is. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight and uh, just going along for that uh, wild ride. I hope, hope you enjoyed yourself. Up for that one. Like, that's good. Yeah, definitely learned some things about me, I guess. And uh, and we're gonna do it all again in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, folks, get money, get high, give love, and be excellent to each other, man. Ooh, damn me meow. And also a little bit row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, but like a Viking. So put your back into the oars. Put your back into it, but do it gently, but also like... Don't throw it fine. out. Don't throw out your back. Just row the boat. It's fine. We'll get from A to B and all be excellent to each other. So there you go. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>